West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Paula, everyone's trying to figure out where this goes next. What do we know about how this investigation will actually unfold? Well, at the outset, the most important thing is that this is not a criminal investigation. This is effectively an after-action review. It was requested by the city's mayor that the Justice Department come in, look at exactly what happened here, and produce a report analyzing what went wrong and also establishing best practices going forward. Because, of course, the sad fact is we do expect other active shooter incidents like this at schools. At this point, though, Phil, I mean, the city really needs the credibility of the Justice Department here for them to come in and objectively gather evidence and analyze exactly what happened here. Now, in a statement, the Justice Department said that the goal of its review is to provide an independent account of law enforcement actions and responses that day and to identify the lessons learned and best practices to help first responders prepare for and respond to active shooter events. Now, the Justice Department has done similar reviews of how police responded to the terrorist attack in San Bernardino, as well as how they responded to the Pulse nightclub shooting. After they analyze all of this evidence, they will produce a report, again, with those recommendations, forward-looking recommendations for other law enforcement agencies. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point to, to point out in the details what this is and what this isn't. But, but more broadly, I think, as everybody has tried to grapple with the timeline we saw last week, is there a possibility at some point that the officers who chose not to go into the school could be faced with some type of negligence charges, child neglect charges, something along those lines? Well, at this point, based on the evidence that we have, it's just not clear. Certainly, there's always a possibility if during this review, even though it's not a criminal investigation, then cover any potential evidence of criminal conduct. We certainly pass that along to prosecutors. But, Phil, we know charging officers, law enforcement officials, for things that they do in the course of their official duty, it's a very high bar, which is why those kind of charges are rare. Now, we did see in Parkland, we saw that a Broward County Sheriff's deputy working as a school a school resource officer, he was ultimately charged uh, with child neglect and negligence. But that's a novel case. And there are a lot of legal scholars out there who question whether he actually had a duty uh, to respond, whether he should have been criminally charged. Again, it's a great question. It's an open question at this point in this investigation, though. We're just not there. We don't have all the facts yet. Yeah, so much more to come. Paula Reed. Thanks so much. Joining us now, CNN counterterrorism analyst and former FBI special intelligence advisor, Philip Mudd. Phil, good to see you. 75 minutes the officers waited outside. 75 minutes. What do you think this does to the whole good guy with a gun argument? Well, if you look at me personally, I'm going to say it raises questions, obviously, about someone who took an oath to protect us, is willing to sacrifice their lives. I think there's some follow on questions that make that a little bit murkier, John. The first is, and the reason that one reason the Department of Justice would go in to investigate this is what were those officers trained to do and what did they confront when they walked in the building that related to the training they had? 
The second is far more complicated. There's a lot of police agencies responding to this. America has maybe, maybe the most decentralized policing on the planet, something like 17,000 police agencies in the United States. What was the communication among the different agencies? Were there crossed wires? How were they communicating back to their uh, central command center? So uh, there's gonna be obviously the, the, the difficult question about whether people decline to go in for whatever reason, but I think there are a lot more complicated questions behind that on things like coordination and communication, John. So I want to go back to the end of last week when our Shimon Procupes asked a very crystallizing question that got a very clarifying answer from those in charge on the ground in Uvalde. Here it is. You have people who are alive, children who are calling 911 saying, please send the police. They are alive in that classroom. There are lives that are at risk. Hey, That's not the we're, protocol, we're, well, is we're, it? we're well aware of that. Right, yeah. but I, why was this decision made not to go in and rescue these children? Again, you know, the on-scene commander considered it a barricaded subject and that there was time and there were no ch more children at risk. Obviously, ob obviously, you know, based upon the information we have, there were children in that classroom that were at risk and it was, in fact, still an active shooter situation and not a barricaded subject. It would be highly unusual, Phil, for that on-scene commander to not be getting information from dispatch about these 911 calls. That is just regularly relayed information. So DOJ obviously needs to figure out what he was learning. I, I assuming it was a he, maybe it was a she, but they need to figure out what the on-scene commander was learning, right? Yeah, I think there are some fundamental questions you look at here. Look, this is not a criminal investigation the Department of Justice will do. That's a separate issue. But if you look at some of the basic lessons learned question DOJ will raise, you just mentioned one that we were talking about a moment ago, and that is communication. There's got to be interviews, obviously, with the on-scene commander to say not only how he was communicating or she was communicating with the command center, but whether there are multiple command centers getting 911 calls and how those are being coordinated. One of the really difficult questions here, it sounds boring, but it's really difficult, is training. We have this epidemic of shootings in this country. If you're dealing with 17,000 police agencies, some of them have one, two, three, five officers. How do you train someone in a, in a department of that size? You can't just familiarize them, you've got to train them. How do you train that number of agencies to respond to an incident like this and differentiate between someone who's barricaded and when you have a live shooter situation? This is really more complicated than it might have looked at the outset last week, Brianna. But Phil, just take people through how you expect this DOJ investigation to play out, because folks will be expecting some accountability. Is that a misplaced hope? Though? I don't think it's misplaced hope, but that would not be the primary responsibility of the investigation. Let's look at two channels. The DOJ will go in and this will take months. You're talking about a report that easily could hit 500 pages. You've got to look at the basics, those communications we're talking about with command centers, things like video from the school. But think about all the interviews with the people on scene and the witnesses, especially if those witnesses have cell phone cameras. All those witnesses, they're, they're going to be unreliable. They will say different things, so the investigators have to spend months sorting out why person A said something and person B said something fundamentally different about the same incident. And you got to come back and say, OK, what do we learn from this? Then there's a separate secondary question that says, given what we learned and what we heard, are there people there who didn't do the right thing? And that's going to be, I think, one of the most painful parts of this. Why is it a complicated call, Phil, if you have children calling 911 saying that there are people who have been shot, but there's also people who are alive, clearly at risk? And you have an on-scene commander saying this is a barricaded suspect situation. Well, let's not make an assumption here. I would not assume, and this is part of the DOJ investigation, that all the information the call center was getting was relayed back okay. to a commander on scene. I would not assume that, that, that the people on scene knew everything that was going on in the room. That's what I'd say. And you, would that be odd, though, for them to not have had that information relayed? I mean, obviously, that would be a, a missing link, right? It would be surprising, but to learn that communications was, was garbled and that people on the scene were trying to figure out what to do in a situation they didn't fully understand, that would not surprise me in the least. 17,000 yeah. police agencies, and we expect perfect communication among them? I don't think so. 
Chaos at a crime scene is a given, but you still had kids being killed in classrooms while more than a dozen officers waited outside for what is apparently yeah. 75 minutes. It is Tuesday, the 31st of May of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays, a small, scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. It always has, and it always will. How are you on this fine Tuesday? I need to give you a heads up. Uh, we might have an abbreviated show, or we might have longer clips uh, because I have to get my mom, my elderly mom, to the doctors for a cortisone shot, which she has needed for a considerable time, and they are backlogged. We've decided, uh, my sister and I, and my mom too, that the hip replacement that we were thinking that maybe she would get, maybe that's not such a good idea now with her, uh, well... Her heart had a big issue. She had a heart attack when she got COVID, by the way, folks. And she lived because she was vaccinated. And uh, I'll just give a little rundown again. There were 10 other women, a total of 11, counting my mom, that were at Asante Three Rivers in Grants Pass. And my mom, oh, between the ages of 32, I believe. And uh, my mom was... 84, 83, 84? Yeah, well, yeah, 84. Uh, and uh, I believe there was a woman maybe around her age. My mom was the only one who survived. Ten died in the amount of time that my mom first went in. Now, she did get transferred to a COVID care home. But while she was there, and those other women who had been admitted when she was admitted, they all died. And not one was vaccinated. So now we have a lot of people taking home tests, of course. And if they do uh, test out to be positive, those results do not necessarily get recorded by the county because they never are sent to the county. And so our infection rates could be considerably higher and deaths... I've been questioning how many true deaths there have been, even in this state, if they've been counted properly. Because re remember in the beginning, people were saying, oh, well, you know, it was like COVID complications. They had, you know, some other underlying condition and, uh, you know, they would have died from that anyway, eventually. The only thing is, is that COVID made it happen faster. So it's got to be counted in the COVID part, but for a while they were. They were not. And by they, I mean care homes, convalescent hospitals, etc. And if they did that in Oregon, imagine how bad it is in the QAnon states. Yeah, we have those now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, that being stated, uh, just a heads up. You might have a few longer audio clips today than I had anticipated when I put the show together. Because I we have to go to Medford for this uh, procedure, and I I'm still thinking I can fit the whole show in before we have to go. But we got to really scoot as soon as the show's over. Otherwise, I might just have to well abbreviate things and make things a little bit longer in other spots. So with that stated, I wanted to also mention uh, came across on my Twitter timeline a young. Uh, rose type icon on their Twitter feed. I wonder what that means. I don't know. It burns me up not being able to figure out what that rose means. Anyway, uh, she was complaining that, uh, you know, she's only getting $10,000 forgiven by Joe Biden and she still has $157,000 student loan debt. And if she thinks, and she said, if you think that I'm getting off my ass to go vote in November, if all I'm getting is $10,000, you got another thing coming. Then I, I couldn't quite understand because I thought maybe it was a snark account. You know, satire 
Because then she purported to be a social worker. And he goes, I don't care. I spent a lot of money on this. And I want my dollars. I want my money. What? Doesn't sound like a social worker to me. But anyway, I don't want anyone having $200,000 student debt. That's insane. And we allowed that to happen? I mean, we're parents. <laughs> we want our kids and ourselves to take out these exorbitant, I don't know, sounds like usury loans to me. You can't pay off the principal and the interest keeps going up even when you pay on the interest. Sounds like usury to me. So the idea of forgiving these loans is tantamount to when you are a victim of a crime. Do you have to keep paying off the loan to the loan shark when they're in jail? What's up with that? Oh, yeah, I forgot. These companies and businesses that invented these instruments so that they could entrap people in this student loan scam aren't uh, being held accountable in a criminal way in which they should have been. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I would almost say, hey, <laughs> but then the, I guess the schools will be out of money. I don't know. You got some deep pocketed alum there. Get it from them. And I still can't uh, believe I'll get back to this uh, timeline lady on Twitter in just a second. But I still it's still hard to fathom. People who are, I think, of a certain age complaining about free education when we all had free education. And I mean from elementary school up into college. Oh, I know we had to pay some administrative fees. I think one year when I was going to Portland State, it came out to not counting books. Associated student body fee, uh, a few other things. It was like about 70 bucks. Oh, I know. That was like a couple hundred dollars in today's dollars. Oh, my God. Now, granted, I had it easier than most because coming from an extended family of academics, they all believed, and rightfully so, that education is the true way to achieve social mobility. Is it any wonder while they're trying to get rid of education? Because they don't want social mobility. They want delineated lines between the classes so we can have a caste system at least. Not one just that rises organically, but a true caste system. And this is the place that you cannot go. All right. That's what they're trying to get to us. And they are willing to sacrifice our children to get rid of education. Yes, the blood of innocence massacred so that parents do not want to send their kids to school anymore. So we'll have to set up some sort of private enterprise. Yeah, institutional learning facility franchises. Get in while it getting's good. All right. And there's not going to be any shootings there, of course. <laughs> yeah, right. Reality comes and bites people in the ass all the time, no matter what kind of conspiracy uh, craziness that you might come up with. Oh, I can fly to Hale Bop. Here, let's take this poison and fly there. Yeah, then reality sets in, and uh, at the point that you think that you're flying, you don't know shit. Because you're dead. As far as we know, we don't know. I've never been dead before, as far as I know. Okay, so is homeschooling going to solve this problem? <sighs> I, I don't think so. I really don't think so. Now, I know that there are examples of homeschooled kids from the liberal side where they benefited and uh, uh, excelled in life. And some may ascribe that to the homeschooling, and I may ascribe it to something a little bit more than what's going on with homeschooling, but also what's going on at the home. So I also know that those who have been homeschooled in a liberal fashion were not sequestered from the rest of society and made to believe that, I don't know, we are next to God and everybody else is evil Satan. Yeah. Evil descended upon our society, and it was manifested in Uvaldi. Evil. That's an easy way of getting out of it, isn't it? Yeah, it is. 
<laughs> well, you know what? Like I said, reality has a way of biting us in the ass, and reality bites. Okay, what's on the menu here that we have curated for you on this fine Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays? Well, the TSA reports a spike in travelers trying to bring guns through airport checkpoints. And i got to tell you, they're not you know, of the liberal persuasion ever. Far-right activist Alan West's bid to take over the NRA ended in humiliating failure. I don't know. <laughs> Whoever wins or loses in the NRA doesn't really seem to, I don't know, elevate it to some sort of, I don't know, elevated business. They never do. And Pope Francis sent a powerful message by elevating a liberal bishop over the wannabe inquisitor archbishop who banned Pelosi from communion. After the break, we move to the chef's table where, ignoring EU sanctions, Serbia secured a gas deal with Putin. And a German federal court is mulling a bid to remove a 700-year-old anti-Semitic relic. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. Uh, to the right of the page is the chat room link, and that chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of the chat room link across the page, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, is the link to our Patreon site. And do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. If you could send us what you might spend on an, on an espresso type coffee drink. Once a month, we're able to stretch those dollars and pay our bills and all the other things that we have to do to keep this powerhouse of resistance resisting. And we thank you for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill that civic duty, which we take quite seriously. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. We uh, post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. We, as in the royal we. And then uh, we, meaning I, post that up on Twitter and other social media platforms. <laughs> sometimes before the show, sometimes not. But regardless, the show notes and links is where the real reportage is. And the full articles, too. So sometimes we abbreviate or we add. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, follow me at Justice Putnam on Twitter. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. And, of course, the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org and the actual link to uh, the Netroots Radio Library at the Internet Archive can be found in the show notes and links and other places as well but if you go to archive.org you'll be able to find Netroots Radio in the search function all right let's tuck into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe I should also give a warning since it was the holiday weekend uh, the uh, the journals that I normally would access to be able to get these items of news seem to have taken the holiday off. So I was running out of timely articles and went to Raw Story. And I, I read Raw Story on my own, but sometimes it's hard to load because I got a lot of stuff going on there when you don't have a subscription. 
But this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is indeed from Raw Story by Matthew Chapman. On Monday, WSOC-TV reported that the U.S. Transportation Security Administration is reporting an upsurge in the number of firearms being found on passengers going through airport security checkpoints. As numbers bounce back to almost pre-pandemic levels, Channel 9 has seen how one gun found at a checkpoint can have an impact on many other passengers looking to catch a flight. TSA officials said the one thing that can bring smooth security lines to a screeching halt are guns found at the checkpoints. And that was in the report. In 2021, Charlotte Douglas set a record 106 guns found at security checkpoints. And TSA leaders said that this year, passengers may break that record. Attempting to bring a gun through a security checkpoint is punishable by fines up to $10,000, that's all, and can result in arrest. (laughs) Wait, it should and better result in arrest, please. Security officials said each time someone attempts to bring a weapon through security, it impacts more than one, just one person. Well, that's what guns do. They said it could impact dozens, if not hundreds of passengers at times, because security shuts down that entire checkpoint lane for 20 minutes or more. TSA official Mark Howell said, we do that for everyone's safety because 85 to 90 percent of the firearms we find are loaded. See, they're so responsible, aren't they? Apparently, Matthew Chapman of Raw Story was one of only a few who were working yesterday, uh, keeping us apprised of all the information that we require. And this next offering comes from Matthew Chapman out of Raw Story. Gun policy journalist Stephen Gutowski yesterday reported that far-right activist Alan West bid to unseat Wayne LaPierre as the National Rifle Association's executive vice president has flamed out spectacularly. According to Gutowski, West himself, a board member of the NRA, got only a single vote at the board meeting, meaning he voted for himself. With 54 members voting to retain LaPierre and seven members abstaining. Well, you know why. They already know what they're getting with LaPierre because he's got, I don't know, how many closets does that guy have? He's a clothes horse. Yes, he is. Well, the vote marks a long string of embarrassments for West, a one-time Tea Party darling, who was elected to Congress in Florida in 2010 and unseated after a single term. He joins Madison Cawthorn for that dubious honor. Or maybe uh, Cawthorn joins him. I think that's what it is. Now, after relocating to Texas, you know, like carpet bagging? West briefly served as chair of the Texas Republican Party, but resigned after 11 months of fighting with fellow GOP leaders and causing controversy by speaking at a QAnon conference in Dallas. West then mounted a primary challenge to Greg Abbott for governor, whom he had publicly protested for briefly issuing COVID-19 emergency uh, orders, and West lost that race by 50. Four points. He first raised the possibility of challenging LaPierre for control of the NRA at the beginning of May ahead of the organization's convention in Houston. And this comes as LaPierre himself has come under increasing controversy. He is one of several NRA executives mired in legal battles over allegations of self-enrichment 
you, you don't get that many closets if you're not enriching yourself. Let's be clear. And the use of nonprofit funds for luxury travel and other personal expenses, like building, I don't know, a bunch of closets for your clothes. New York Attorney General Letitia James has sought to have him barred from serving on the board under New York charity law, which the NRA tried to dodge by reincorporating in Texas under bankruptcy proceedings only for a judge to block the plan. David Badash of the New Civil Rights Movement, by way of Raw Story, brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Pope Francis on Sunday sent the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops a clear and strong rebuke by elevating the Bishop of San Diego to Cardinal just days after the Archbishop of San Francisco's repeated and very public attack against Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. Archbishop Salvatore Cordelione ten days ago banned Speaker Pelosi from receiving Holy Communion, one of the most sacred elements of Catholic worship. Despite the Vatican's and the Pope's insistence, the Eucharist not be politicized. Cordelione said he did so because of her pro-choice stance on abortion. But as Pelosi remarked, the Catholic Church has never banned anyone from communion for supporting the death penalty. Not only did Cordelione, a right-wing activist who has refused to be vaccinated against COVID-19, ban Pelosi from taking communion, he did so extremely publicly. Cordelione went as far as to post a letter to Pelosi on Twitter, calling her stance on abortion a most serious scandal and a grave evil. He then appeared on EWTN, a Catholic news cable network, to defend his decision, and even posted that interview on social media. Seven days after his very public rebuke of Pelosi, he again chastised her on Twitter, writing that she has strong opinions on what the church teaches, but she is wrong. And that is why I, I had to act. Pope Francis has made clear no one should be banned from communion, certainly not for political reasons. Well, I got to tell you, when my mom divorced my dad, we were not allowed communion in a couple of parishes. What must the pastor do, Pope Francis said last year? The New York Times noted when a reporter asked him about another Catholic, President Joe Biden and his stance on abortion, be a pastor, don't go condemning, be a pastor because he is a pastor also for the excommunicated. I have never refused the Eucharist to anyone, Pope Francis also told reporters. On Sunday, in that apparent strong rebuke against Corte Leon, Pope Francis announced he is elevating a lower-ranking bishop, progressive Robert McElroy of San Diego to cardinal, a position over Corte Leon's. Isn't that weird? San Diego is a bastion of, like, I gotta tell you, pretty pro, uh, I don't know, maggot uh, attitudes. But... You don't choose your flock all the time. Sometimes your flock chooses you. The choice of Bishop McElroy is the biggest surprise of this consistatory, the Council of Cardinals for the Church in the United States, reports the Jesuit publication America. A graduate of Harvard, Stanford, 
and the Pontifical Gregorian University, Bishop McElroy has demonstrated that he is one of the strongest supporters of the Pope's vision of church among American bishop since bishops since Francis appointed him to be bishop in San Diego in March of 2015. By choosing him to be a cardinal instead of others, Pope Francis is sending a powerful message to the American bishops and the church. In reporting McElroy's elevation, the San Francisco Chronicle adds that Cor de Leon has engaged in a very public campaign against Pelosi and abortion rights as a whole. In October, he started digital and radio ads urging Catholics to pray to change the minds of Pelosi and other politicians who support abortion rights. Well, how about applying that to guns and the death penalty, fella? One year ago this month, McElroy wrote in America, the Eucharist is not weaponized for political ends. This must not happen. He added, the proposal to exclude pro-choice Catholic political leaders from the Eucharist will bring tremendously destructive consequences. Indeed. Well, let's get to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. Then i got to get out of here to take my mom to the doctors. <laughs> you are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is 60 Second Science. I'm Tulika Bose. You might know that a leaked memo recently revealed that Roe v. Wade could be overturned, which could have massive implications for women's health. What you might not know is how your trusty smartphone could be used to enforce that. I'm here with Sophie Bushwick, our tech editor, who is going to go a little bit more into depth about the ramifications of this. Hey, Sophie. Hi. So tell me about this. What's going on? So in the wake of news about the potential fall of Roe v. Wade, it came to light that, you know, about 13 states have what are called trigger laws on the books. So these are laws that would kick in as soon as Roe v. Wade would be overturned and would immediately uh, make abortion in partially or entirely illegal in those states. Some people were worrying online about the potential need to delete data from their period tracking apps. I decided to look more into this question. Can your period tracking app reveal information that could later land you, you know, land you in court? And what I found was period tracking apps are really the tip of the iceberg. The real issue is that your phone gathers a huge amount of data about you every single day. And yes, that data can be used to reveal if you're pregnant and if you um, plan to or do obtain an abortion. Tell me a little bit more about your phone being this like major tracker of information. I know it records a huge volume of data, but what are some of the things that your phone could be recording that could then be used against you in court? Most people carry their phones with them wherever they go, and uh, your phone tracks your location. Every time you look something up on the internet or you use a, an online browser to make a search, that can be recorded uh, by the companies um, whose apps you have on your phone. If you have a period tracking app on your phone, you might enter data on your period, and that can calculate your fertility. It can even tell if you're pregnant before you know that yourself. Your phone can, can figure things out, like how often someone goes to the bathroom. Okay, that is wild. Yeah. Um, your phone can tell how often you go to the bathroom. If you know which data to pull from a phone, uh, yes, you can figure out what, what somebody's bathroom habits are. A phone is a very useful surveillance tool. It, it is dystopian because we don't have a lot of legal restrictions on what data companies are allowed to gather, on how long they're allowed to keep that data. Okay, so we know that if basic activity like seeking reproductive health care becomes criminalized, um, experts have said courts could even issue a warrant for your device, which would then reveal all of that personal information you were talking about. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? 
That's right. If somebody is uh, involved in a court case, um, their phone, the information can be extracted from it, and then all that trove of data can be used uh, against them in court. But something that's actually a little bit more worrying for uh, privacy experts is the way that law enforcement can sidestep the need for a warrant at all. Something that has a lower bar than a warrant is a subpoena, and that can be issued to um, a company that collects data, and you wouldn't need to get the data directly from a person's phone in that case. You could just get it from the company that gathers the data. I would like to know if there's precedent. Has that been done before? Have people's devices been used in a a case of subpoena or anything like that? Yes. uh, Probably the most well-known example is a case in Mississippi where a woman had a miscarriage. It was suspected that she had induced it. So in order to find intent, uh, law enforcement used information from her phone that showed that she had searched for how to induce a miscarriage. And as a result of this, she was indicted for a second degree murder by a grand jury. Now, in this case, the charges against her were later dropped. But in a post row world in a state where abortion is illegal, you could very easily see um, a case where people who experience a miscarriage then become criminal suspects. I want to talk about the period tracking apps, and I want to talk about HIPAA. So are period tracking apps protected by HIPAA? No. So HIPAA is a law that basically says, you know, your healthcare provider can't share your healthcare information without your consent. But a period tracking app does not count as a healthcare provider. It's not covered by HIPAA. So period tracking apps have the ability to sell your data to data brokers and to other entities. Obviously, the most secure option is to not use one at all. But there are uh, apps that prize security more than others. And so you do want to see what their privacy policies these different apps are. That's really good to know. And my last question, are there ways you can protect yourself right now? So some tips include if you want to hide your browsing activity more effectively, um, you could use a browser that's privacy centric like Tor or Bravo, or you could, if you're using another browser, you could use it in um, incognito or private mode. Um, What you can do if you really want to hide your activity more effectively is use a VPN or virtual private network that prevents your internet service provider from snooping on your your web activity. Another thing that you, you want to do in general is just have good security. You want to protect Protect your phone with a strong password as opposed to using, you know, a biometric unlocking mechanism. Um, You should protect all your accounts with strong passwords. One of the best ways to do that is to use a password manager so that you don't have to remember a bunch of different long strings of symbols and letters and numbers. Uh, We'll put a full list of tips in the transcript of this podcast as well. So just scroll down to the end and you can see some ways to keep yourself safe. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thanks for having me. For 60 Second Science, I'm Tulika Bose. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Last July, several GOP senators combined their 5-watt intellects to charge that inflation was rising because of, quote, insane tax and spending spree of President Biden and the Democrats. Never mind that the insane spending is for such sensible, productive, and enormously popular national needs as child care and jobless benefits. Mitch McConnell's rabidly partisan flock saw the chance to politicize the public's legitimate worries about rising prices. You poor consumers are made to pay more for basics, they squawked, because of Socialist Joe's investment in grassroots people. Follow the ricocheting pinball of the GOP's logic. 
One, they say that helping hard-hit families induces them to refuse to go to work. Two, this creates blockages in the global supply chain. Three, this causes shortages of everything. Four, this forces corporate bosses to raise all prices. Which, five, slams the middle class and poor, so six, lazy workers cause inflation. Whoa, Rube Goldberg couldn't have dreamed up a more fantastical diagram to deflect attention from what's really happening. Namely, that instead of an inflation problem, we have a corporate greed problem. Of course, the greed meisters insist that their pursuit of excess corporate profits has not driven any price surges. In our economy of free market competition, they snap. Prices are established by the law of supply and demand. It's the magic of the marketplace, they explain. But magicians don't do magic. They perform illusions. And the illusion of free market competition implodes when it hits the reality that our economy doesn't remotely resemble a competitive marketplace. This is Jim Hightower saying, for some 40 years, corporate-directed government policies have been transforming America into monopoly nation, letting the few gouge the many. That's where inflation comes from. Howdy ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. George Washington was a leader of a revolution that was one of history's greatest advances for individual liberty. Yet throughout his life, he denied liberty to others as a slaveholder and gained wealth from their labor. Washington accepted the legality of slavery and the property rights of slaveholders. He took steps to prevent some of his own slaves from running away to freedom when traveling to northern states. Realizing that the issue of abolition could well divide the young republic, he never made a public statement in opposition to slavery. Nevertheless, Washington's private correspondence shows that he had come to reject slavery, both for the human suffering it caused and on principle. His doubts about slavery seem to date from the time of the Revolution, when he stopped selling or purchasing Africans. He later wrote, I am principled against this kind of traffic in the human species. He came to see slavery itself as an immoral, if not illegal, institution. There's not a living being who wishes its abolition more sincerely than I do. In the will he drafted in 1799, he provided for his slaves to be freed after his and Martha's death and set up a fund to care for those who were elderly or infirm. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1889. Nestled in western Pennsylvania was the community known as Johnstown. The town and surrounding area was home to 23,000 people, families of workers who labored in the region's booming steel mills. Those who lived in the town had to deal with the soot that fell on their homes from the billowing smokestacks of the mills. But just 15 miles above Johnstown, there stood a very different place. The South Fork Hunting and Fishing Fishing Club. This was an exclusive area of summer homes for some of the leading industrialists of the day, including Andrew Carnegie, Andrew Mellon, and Henry Clay Frick. The club's members enjoyed fishing and recreating on the 500-acre man-made Lake Konama, the 72-foot-high, 930-foot-wide dam which created the lake was made of earth and in poor repair. Drainage pipes that were supposed to regulate the lake had been removed, sold for scrap, and were not replaced. Despite repeated warnings of the dam's problems, repairs were not made. And so, on a rainy day in May, the lake swelled. Recognizing the dam was in trouble, workers were scrambled to attempt to fortify the dam. But the efforts came too late. The dam failed catastrophically, hurling 20 million tons of water into the valley below. The wall of water reached 40 feet high and half a mile wide and carried the force of Niagara Falls. 
2,209 people died in the flood, including 99 whole families. One body was recovered as far away as Cincinnati, Ohio. 1,600 homes were destroyed and there was $17 million in damages. The site became the first peacetime effort for Red Cross relief led by Clara Barton. Not surprisingly, the South Fork Club was never held legally responsible. The courts ruled the flood an act of God. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently... 47 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting to be much warmer than yesterday when it was just merely in the mid-60s. We are going to be in the low 80s today. Tonight will be partly cloudy with lows in the low 50s, winds remaining light and variable, and then cloudy tomorrow with highs again in the low 80s, winds out of the north-northwest picking up to 5 to 10 miles per hour. And I should mention that there is a forecast for uh, more than a quarter inch of rain starting on Friday and going through the weekend. We can only hope because we need all the water we can get. As you know, confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon will not be updated until probably after showtime on Wednesday if we are lucky. Currently, we stand at confirmed cases at 441,067 folks, and our deceased remains at 541, and we'll see if those numbers increase after Wednesday. Grass pollen is rated very high right outside the window here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the Rogue River Valley region is good at 20 parts per million. Wow, that's very good, actually, in my book. Though that daytime UV index for the area is very high at level 9. That's very high. I always wear a hat, and I always slather on the SPF 50. I hope that's okay. Also covering up with light-colored clothes, lightly, you know, light in texture or, or uh, fabric. And color is also quite helpful. So if you have heat in your area, take care. Also, UV rays, they seem to be everywhere now. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.14 inches. Visibility is at 9 miles and relative humidity is at 87%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 55 degrees with rain. Paris is 70 degrees and sunny. Oh, Paris. Rome is 84 and fair. Eh, that's pretty fair. Kiev is 67 and partly cloudy. Kabul is 66 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 81 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 68 and mostly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 53 and clear. San Francisco, California is 54 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 90 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. This 
Jason Stoyanovich of the AP brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. As the war in Ukraine rages, Serbia's president announced that he has secured an extremely favorable natural gas deal with Russia during a phone conversation with Vladimir Putin. Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic has refused to explicitly condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and his country has not joined Western sanctions against Moscow. Vucic claims he wants to take Serbia into the EU, but has spent recent years cementing ties with Russia, a longtime ally. The gas deal is likely to be signed during a visit by Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to Belgrade early in June, a rare visit by a ranking Russian official to a European country since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Vucic said he told Putin that he wished peace would be established as soon as possible. Serbia is almost entirely dependent on Russian gas, and its main energy companies are under... Russian Majority Ownership. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles rester Toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Associated Press staff. Bring us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A German federal court yesterday, Monday, mulled a Jewish man's bid to force the removal of a 700 year old anti Semitic statue from a church where Martin Luther once preached and said it will deliver its verdict in the long running dispute next month. The Judensau, or Jew pig, Sculpture on the town church in Wittenberg is one of more than 20 such relics from the Middle Ages that still adorn churches across Germany and elsewhere in Europe. The case went to the Federal Court of Justice after lower courts ruled in 2019 and 2020 against plaintiff Michael Duhlmann, who had argued that the sculpture was a defamation of and insult to the Jewish people that has a terrible effect up to this day and as suggested, moving it to the nearby Luther House Museum. Placed on the church about 13 feet above ground level, the sculpture depicts people identifiable as Jews suckling the teats of a sow while a rabbi lifts the animal's tail. In 1570, after the Protestant Reformation, an inscription referring to an anti-Jewish tract by Luther was added. In 1988, a memorial was set into the ground below referring to the persecution of Jews and the six million people who died during the Holocaust. In addition, a sign gives information about the sculpture in German and English. Presiding Judge Stephen Sider said at Monday's hearing that viewed individually, the statue is an anti-Semitism chiseled into stone. However, the later additions in context are likely to be a key factor in his court's decision as well. Duhlman's lawyer argued that the information on the sign is not sufficient and that the depiction of a pig was a sign of hatred even if it was put up. The federal court, based in the southwestern city of Karlsruhe, plans to announce its ruling on June 14th. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère De mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 